If you would have believed in Moses, you would have believed in me because he wrote about me. I'm not setting up some sort of impossible hoop for you to jump through. The Christian Bible claims that it is the fulfillment of the Hebrew Bible. That is a fantastic claim. That doesn't mean it's not true, but fantastic claims require fantastic evidence. live on the air. Please tell us your name and where you're calling from. Yes. Uh, you just heard the Word of God. All the things that you teach against uh, Christianity and Judaism, you distort. It's really clear to Christian that the things that you're talking about against the Son of God is completely false. In the beginning, the Word of God in Hebrew means that Jesus was crucified before the beginning of creation, before the foundation of the world. That's what Bereshit means in Hebrew. Because you don't believe that he is who he is, you teach false doctrine. It's very clear in the book of Revelation and in the, in the beginning in Hebrew that it, they mean the same thing. And I don't know, you need to ask God to, to show you the word and the truth. He will show you if you ask him. Because he promises that when you search for him with all your heart and you diligently search, search for him, he will show you the truth because God can't lie. Anyway, you're teaching so much false doctrine. You have people on there that say that they were Christian. Those people don't even know what they're talking about. Because a real Christian knows that Jesus was died on the cross because this was a mystery that God revealed in the New Testament. It also relates to Abraham. He was fully persuaded that what God had promised he was able to do. And the seed that was promised came uh, through Abraham's seed. And it's all in the Bible, the New Testament and the Old Testament is a revelation of the Son of God, the Trinity. Even though you don't believe it, it's still true. Anyway, I I'm still praying for you. I hope uh, you received us in Jesus' name. I think that you and I could definitively outline our difference. You go to Rabbi Paul, you go to Rabbi John, and I go to Rabbi Moses and Rabbi Isaiah, and I want you to know about them. As it turns out, the mistake you make is one that is pervasive in the Christian world. You read Christian teachings into the Hebrew Bible when they're not there. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, Bereshus bara Elohim es ha-shemayim in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. There's nothing there about the crucifixion or the cross prior to the creation of the world. You're getting that from the book of Revelation, chapter 13, verse 8, the notion that the word became flesh. That's from the prologue of John. So I think your question is valuable because you're really italicizing how it is that Christians come to believe in the doctrines of the church. They're not reading the Hebrew Bible. They're not reading Genesis 1-1 and going, oh, there's the crucifixion. They're rather reading the book of Revelation. They're going to John rather than to Moses. And they're reading the prologue of John almost certainly not the same author as the book of Revelation, and reading the prologue, the first 18 passages of John, because it begins, in the beginning was the Word, and that's clearly plagiarized from Genesis, but it's not there. So it is true that if you read the Christian Bible, if that's your foundation— and then you read that in to the Hebrew Bible, you're going to wind up in exactly the predicament that not only you, but billions of people around the world have found themselves in. And that is that they're worshiping a false god. They believe in the Trinity. They, like you, hold that in order to be saved, you have to believe in the cross. And that's what's going on here. It's not that Christians are insane or evil people. That's not what's happening. But what they're doing is they're reading the Christian Bible, and that's what you're expressing. 
you've expressed ideas that are found all over the New Testament. And you kind of alluded to this, that there is a grand mystery. And the grand mystery is spoken of explicitly in the Christian Bible. The whole salvation program is a grand mystery. Now, if God's salvation program is so clearly in the Hebrew Bible, why would there be a mystery? Like, why mystery? And the reason why Paul speaks of a mystery all over the place in Ephesians 3.3, 3, in 1 Corinthians 2, 7 and 8, is because it really is a mystery because he's making it up. The reason it's so mysterious and only Paul through Revelation could do it sin because it's not based on the Hebrew Bible. If it was explicitly in the Hebrew Bible, and just clearly in the Hebrew Bible, there'd be no mystery, right? I mean, in that I put on tefillin, in that I remember and guard, protect, observe the Sabbath. There's nothing mysterious about that. It's explicitly commanded in Exodus chapter 31, in Deuteronomy chapter 5, Ten Commandments, Exodus chapter 20. You notice there's nothing in these epic passages about a somebody dying for your sins or Calvary or the Messiah dying or rising, none of that. There's none of that in the Hebrew Bible. And that's why Paul says that this is a grand mystery, and unless you're privy to this mystery, you won't have salvation. Why would he need to call it a mystery? Well, it's a mystery because no one ever heard of it. Paul concedes this point in 1 Corinthians, which is an indisputed letter of Paul. Chapter 2, verse 7 and 8, he says that, in fact, if only the rulers of the generation had known this revelation, they would have never crucified the Lord of glory, which doesn't really make sense, because if the Messiah was supposed to die, why wouldn't they have crucified him? I mean, the whole thing is silly. But why is it this grand mystery? The grand mystery is because this is so Gnostic that there's a secret information. This even comes through in the Gospels when we're told that Jesus explains why is he speaking in parable. Now, most people, if I asked you in the view of the New Testament, why is Jesus speaking in parables? Most people say, well, that's a, a very clever way of teaching. It's a way of making things simple so anyone can understand. I'm sure there are so many Christians watching me right now, hearing my voice, and that's exactly what you're thinking. You're thinking that the reason why Jesus was teaching in parables is because he was a fabulous teacher. He was using a methodology of communication that was well-known in the Bible, well-known to the rabbis, and he was just employing it. But from the viewpoint of the Christian Bible, the reason why Jesus was teaching in parables, it's so that people don't understand it, and only those who are meant to be saved would grasp it. It's really very Gnostic that there's special secret knowledge that you needed to have. It's just exactly the opposite. There are so many wonderful prophecies in the Hebrew Bible that are so clear, nothing mysterious about them. The word mystery is never associated with the coming of the Messiah. A man from the root of Jesse will judge people, not by the sight of his eyes, the spirit of Hashem. Nations will be so deeply moved, inspired by his remarkable message that they'll put aside their implements of war and transform them into implements of agriculture. Nation will not lift up sword against nation, neither will they learn of war anymore as we're speaking now. Germany is sending its most sophisticated tanks, war machines, to the Ukraine, as is America sending its Abrams tanks to the Ukraine. That won't exist in the Messianic age. Lo yisa goy el goy cherev, v'lo yilmedu oid mechama. Nation will not lift up sword against nation, neither will they learn of war anymore. Nothing about a dying Messiah, nothing, absolutely nothing. The church depends, hopes, 
relies on the ignorance of its parishioners, of its churchgoers, so that it can continue to peddle in these aberrant ideas. You take the prologue of John, the first 18 passages of the fourth gospel, we encounter the highest Christology, and you just read that into the Hebrew Bible, though it's there. And I would imagine that people who have no knowledge of the Jewish scriptures might believe that, as you have. Don't be offended. I'm happy you called into the show, but I hope you have a an ear, a spiritual ear to hear, eyes to see, look it up for yourself. There's nothing like that in the Hebrew Bible, nothing. God becoming flesh, God is not a man. He doesn't lie. He's not a mortal. He doesn't change his mind. See First Samuel chapter fifteen verse twenty nine. The gam netzach Yisrael lo yishaker ki le adam hu lihinachem. What could be more clear than that? You talk about the promise of the seed. Paul would have you believe in his second most important letter, going back to Genesis when God spoke to Abraham, that he was promising in Genesis 12 and 13, 17, that there would be a seed. And what is that seed? After all, it's in the singular. It says seed, not seeds. Look, I beg you to do this. I beg you to go to the book of Galatians, chapter 3, verse 16. This is what you're quoting. This is you. You're saying this. So do this. Go to Galatians, chapter 3, verse 16. Make sure that I have not misquoted this passage. Galatians 3 is there. You quoted from it. To demonstrate that the covenant of faith which was given to Abraham in Genesis 15, is superior to the covenant that God made with Moses. After all, Paul claims, the law was given through angels. A complete lie, totally made up. The book of Acts will have Stephen peddle in that same nonsense. There's no angel there, directly from God. See that it doesn't say to his seeds but rather says to his seed. As it turns out, in biblical Hebrew, there is no word seeds. It doesn't exist. So Paul is being disingenuous with his audience, and he can get away with it. Why? Because to whom was the book of Galatians written? It was written to non-Jews. He can get away with it. He was writing to churches in Asia Minor during the 50s, people who were former pagans, they had no chance. And Paul was able to get away with this scandalous Bible hermeneutics. So there's nothing in Genesis that would be a cross before the foundations of the world. That's the book of Revelation, a book that many early Christians, to their credit, knew does not belong in the New Testament. And this is what you're doing. You're taking the book of Revelation and you're inserting it into the Hebrew Bible. So let me just tell you how the Jewish people operate. We believe that the Hebrew scriptures are the word of God and they're trustworthy and that any claim made subsequently has to be tested by the canon of the Hebrew scriptures. I mean, after all, what what does canon mean? Use that word, but canon means a read, not any kind of read, but a, a measuring read. We test the fantastic claims of any religion against the Hebrew Bible. Scripture says you can't add to it nor take away from it. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 2. You can't add to it or take away from it. And the writers of your Bible eviscerated the teachings of the Jewish scriptures. Moreover, they've added to it. So they have violated this commandment on two accounts. And I would say this to you. I strongly encourage you to begin with the Hebrew Bible. Study it carefully. Not me. Because these are our rabbis. So if you want to upend Judaism, you need to begin with the Hebrew Bible. Just read it, plain. And then you examine the claim 
of another faith and see if ask the question, is this consistent with the Hebrew Bible, and then it might be considered, or is it inconsistent with the Jewish scriptures, and then it must be rejected? One other point. You said, I should pray for this truth. You never pray for doctrine, never. The Bible is full of people who had dreams, false dreams. People dream about what they want to believe about, and it's not an accident that people dream about the religious figures of their own geography. If people are raised in, in Bali, India, they're very likely to dream about the gods of the Hindu religion. Why? Because that's what fills their mind. People in Brazil, in the Philippines, these are Roman Catholic countries. Argentina, it's very likely that people in those countries are dreaming about the Virgin Mary and other saints. Why? Because the Virgin Mary can't fly to Saudi Arabia? This is all very silly. And in fact, Jeremiah warns, stop listening to these dreams. You are the ones who are causing yourself to have these dreams. We don't pray about doctrine. Never pray for wisdom. You pray for health. You never pray for what is the nature of God. Or else what do you need a Torah for? Why do you need Ten Commandments? Why don't just people just pray for the truth? The reason why the Torah is full of teachings, and in fact, that's what the word Torah means, literally means teaching, is that you don't get to pray about doctrine. So I would encourage you to turn back to the Hebrew Bible and use the Hebrew Bible as your canon, as your measuring tool to test the fantastic claims of the church, unless you think that this Rabbi Singer has a unfavorable view of Christianity, and he's setting up a straw man. I'm not. I'm steel manning this. Why? Because your own Christian Bible says that. The Christian Bible claims that it is the fulfillment of the Jewish scriptures. The book of John, chapter 5, if you would have believed in Moses, you would have believed in me because he wrote about me. So I'm not setting up some sort of impossible hoop for you to jump through. The Christian Bible claims that it is the fulfillment of the Hebrew Bible. That is a fantastic claim. That doesn't mean it's not true, but fantastic claims require fantastic evidence. The book of Luke ends with this message in chapter 24, verse 44, 45, 46, that everything he did, and we're talking about dying and rising, is a fulfillment of the Torah, the prophets, and the writings. As it turns out, this is completely made up. It's completely untrue, and the verse that Luke 24 claims to be quoting from is phantom. It doesn't exist. And the same thing goes to Paul. Paul completely invents verses that the Messiah is supposed to die and then rise three days later, according to the scripture in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1, 2, 3, 4. Just read it for yourself. There is no such scripture. He made it up. It can't feel good to believe in a religion that makes up verses, can it? I encourage you to go back to the Hebrew Bible. You and the nations of the world, return back to Tanakh, read it, and turn to the God of Israel with a pure speech to fill the promise of Tsefania, Zephaniah, a prophecy that's two and a half thousand years old. All the nations will speak, Besafa Brura, in a pure speech. Let us hope that we see the coming of the true Mashiach, the Mehera Biyameinu, quickly in our time. Thank you for your call. Adon Olach, Asher Malach, B'terem Kol, Yetzir Nivra, Let Nasa, B'chef Tzokol, Azai Melech, Azai Melech, Shemu Nikra, Veachare, Kiklot Ako, Levado, Imloch Noah, Veoaiyah.